Hi, everyone, and welcome to SDI and SAS for teachers and administrators. In this overview training, we'll be sharing lots of great tips, strategies, and resources. The training today is brought to you by NKCES, and you will um, have all kinds of opportunities to learn with the four of us. Amelia Brown will be sharing literacy strategies. Misty Carr is sharing math strategies. I'm sharing some behavior strategies and Kim Snowball is supporting co-teaching. When you um, are in the Google site for this training, you will note um, that you can access the training through the link that is here on this slide. And um, the training is set up in sections so that you can pace your learning for what works best for you. Um, you are in the welcome section right now on the upper left hand side. After you complete this video, then you will want to dive into co-teaching with Kim and she's got several handouts that are linked in there. Next, you'll dive into SDI and SAS in reading with Amelia and link into her resources. Misty's got lots of articles and resources for math. Then you will complete your learning in SDI and SAS and behavior with me um, with some slides and uh, video. For each of the videos, the um, titles are what are hyperlinked in that will take you to the videos and then the resources you see hyperlinked in there also. After you complete your learning, you will want to choose the quiz that is right for you. If you are a teacher who is seeking um, professional development or PD credit for the training, you will take the quiz on the right. If you are an administrator seeking ELA credit in the state of Kentucky, or an administrator in another state seeking uh, credit for administrators, you will take the quiz on the left. Whichever quiz you take, you will need to earn 80% accuracy. No worries if you don't get it the first time, you are welcome to take the quiz as many times as you need. And my email address is linked into the Google site as well as um, both of the quizzes, uh, Lara Clark at nkces.org and I am happy to help if you have any questions at all. So in the overview section of our training, we're gonna be talking about these big rocks. And we're gonna start by looking at specially designed instruction or SDI and SAS, which is Supplementary Aids and Services. Uh, we'll look at those specific definitions. We'll also talk about the differences between accommodations and modifications and look at all of this through a universal design for learning or UDL lens. Um, just some quick notes to jot. Remember that SDI is always delivered first by a special education teacher, and then it can be so supported by other adults in the building. Supplementary aids and services is what the student needs. So SDI is adult-centered and SAS is student-centered. Now, when we're looking at accommodations and modifications, we can provide both in instruction. When it comes to testing, um, then we must follow our state and district guidelines for what is appropriate depending on the tests that are being administered. Keep in mind that accommodations are more often provided for students with specific learning disabilities or those mild to moderate disabilities. Anytime you're providing an accommodation, you are not in any way impacting the rigor of the curriculum. So if every student is reading a passage, um, an accommodation might be for technology or another person to read the passage. The student is still accessing the same rigor of content, the same exact content, they're just accessing it a different way. A modification, though, is very much changing, decreasing the complexity of the content. So while every other student might be reading a novel, a student with a more significant disability might need a two-sentence summary or a four-picture summary of that novel to be able to access the content. So we want to be very clear when we're using any of these terms that we're using them in the appropriate context and that everyone has an understanding of what those terms actually mean. They cannot be used interchangeably and sometimes still are in our profession. So we want to be very explicit with people about what each of those terms means. 
Um, throughout the overview, you will have different things linked in that you can use as resources. And so here I've linked in an overview handout and you see it right on the right hand side. Um, there is a great website that you might want to dive into. And I clipped a small piece out of some of the resources that they have at the Center for Parent Information and Resources website on um, defining supplementary aids and services and specially designed instruction. The information there is synthesized very nicely and is a great resource to share with teachers and parents. The key terms are also defined there at the bottom of the page um, just to help clarify for folks. When you are thinking about um, specially designed instruction and supplementary aids and services, there's just a few big pieces that we want to think through together, no matter what your role in teaching is. If you are a general education teacher supporting students with disabilities in your classroom, if you are a special education teacher who is helping draft an IEP and supporting students in their individual goals, or if you're an administrator who is supporting a team of teachers or an entire building or district of teachers, we wanna be all on the same page with some ways that we can really increase the impact for students with disabilities. So a few things to consider for all of us, um, whether we are working in grade level teams or um, if we are working in content specific teams, anytime that we can share lesson planning, share resources, share um, test preparation, we can really um, increase our capacity. This will also help us that um, work together and work smarter, not harder, right? Where we can really start looking at things through multiple lenses and think through how we can support all learners in our classroom. In order for that to be accomplished, we really need to think through those bigger structures of our schools, things like common planning time for teaching teams um, to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to sit down at the table together and do some planning. Um, in addition to that time being set aside, having really specific agendas and goals so that we're working very efficiently towards developing appropriate content for our students. Making sure that our lesson plans are incorporating specially designed instruction and supplementary aids and services, that we're explicitly stating what we're providing for students to make sure that we are targeting that in every lesson. Being able to learn from other teachers is a key way to grow in our profession. So being able to think about doing some collaborative learning walks uh, and working with other teams, whether it's in our building, across our district, or across our state, but really working together to see what best practices look like um, when we're all teaching to the best of our capacity. It's also important to make sure we've got time as a team to analyze student level data and make sure that we are providing appropriate access to the content. So for example, analyzing our curriculum to see what the reading levels are on all of our texts, if that's not explicitly stated in our books, and then looking at student level data to see where students are reading to see if we need to provide some accommodations for our students. We really want to think through how might our teaching and learning look different if we had first in mind the SDI and SAS required for our students with disabilities. And then how might that lens support the learning of all students? And here we're talking about that universal design for learning lens. So when we think about universal design for learning, what we're thinking about often um, is doing something uh, the smartest way possible so that everyone in the classroom has access. The universal design for learning um, work came initially out of the world of architecture when the Americans with Disabilities Act came into being. And we started thinking about being ADA compliant. So one of the specific structures that was put in place with ADA compliance was the addition of curb cuts. And so those curb cuts were initially put in place so that people with mobility issues could access sidewalks. So people who use wheelchairs and walkers. But if you think about how convenient curb cuts are for all of us, including us teachers and administrators who drag around big boxes full of materials all the time, um, for our restaurants and our favorite beverage providers use those curb cuts to um, get resources into restaurants. 
when we think about um, kids who use curb cuts um, on bikes and rollerblades and uh, adults who use them for strollers and bike riding, everyone uses those curb cuts, even though they were specifically added for a very small population of our citizenry. It's the same way in our classrooms. When we think about that UDL lens, we might specifically be building something for a specific population of students, um, but it's benefiting everyone in the classroom. So let me give you a few examples. Oh, and I will say before I change this slide, there's a link to the CAST website, which is one of the premier websites to really explore universal design for learning. And that link is in yellow up on the upper right hand corner of the slide. If you want to dive deeper into the world of universal design for learning, and I really hope you do, um, then on this page, I've got another link to a further layer within the UDL guidelines website. And each and every one of these items are hyperlinked into additional resources. When we think about UDL, and we think about often these three different bigger picture pieces, um, how we can provide different ways for students to engage in the content, how we can provide different ways to represent the content, and how we can provide different ways for action and expression of the content. So things like self-regulation, right, and being able to express and communicate what you're learning. I'm thinking about that persistence and sustained effort in tasks. These are things that might be very specific to some students with disabilities, but many students um, also have those same challenges. So are there ways that we can increase access for all students? Yes, there are. And the um, links are all embedded here. You can dive deeper into areas that are of specific interest to you in your classroom or your district to support your students. There are two fantastic videos if you would like to review the key concepts or share out um, with other folks in your buildings to look at that UDL lens. And I've got a few examples I wanted to share with you thinking about UDL. So on the left um, is an example um, and one that I used every year when I was teaching. I often worked with students that had some fine motor difficulties and cutting could be challenging. So rather than just provide one pair of adapted scissors for the one or two students who might need it, I went ahead and asked my building administrator if we could purchase five or 10 pairs of adapted scissors. And so we had multiple sets and I had bins full of different kinds of scissors, you know, big scissors, small scissors. These, these are called loop scissors that you see here in this picture. Some, some loop scissors that we got from the eSpecial Needs catalog, which I've linked to in here and where I got the image. And these scissors were open for everyone. So anytime we cut, I just put the scissor bin out and anyone could choose any pair of scissors that they needed. Another great example you see in this presentation is closed captioning. You know, that's for a very specific group of students who might need closed captioning, but it actually benefits um, lots of students who can use the content. I will say that a further benefit, not just of closed captioning, but of using Screencastify or some kind of a screen recording to capture the content is that lots of students need to be able to go back and review content multiple times in order to start to master it. This can include students who were absent for the day, students who are English learners, um, students who might be struggling in a content area but not struggling significantly enough to qualify for an IEP, um, or some students who are just having a hard time with that particular concept. Always good to record your content so that students can listen to it later. Another example would be um, some sensory supports. We have lots of students that are coming to us with some kind of trauma in their background. They might have qualified under the category of OHI or EBD, um, or they might just have um, some kind of trauma in their background, and we know they need some additional supports. So we could provide just supports for that one student, but a better practice would be a UDL lens where we're providing um, what are being known as calm down centers or peace corners in our classroom where we're explicitly teaching all students how to use these tools and then offering that opportunity for everyone to use it when they're feeling anxious or stressed in the classroom. I've linked in two examples, um, one secondary and one elementary, so that you could examine this as, if this is something you don't already have in place in your school.
Another great example, and when we think about students with more significant disabilities who might be using some kind of a communication device or a core vocabulary uh, like the one I have pictured here, and this one is from Assistware. They're the makers of Proloquo to Go, and they have some free core vocabulary. Um, my favorite one is the four page core vocabulary board and the bottom hyperlink will take you to that. So an idea is to print out a large copy of this to hang on the general education classroom wall. And then for every student and every teacher, general education teachers, related arts teachers to have copies of these core boards. And when we're communicating and thinking about um, responses where we might use a response card system, everyone could respond using these core boards. So one of the core boards has the words yes, no, you know, more and less are on this core board. Um, we can look at all different kinds of vocabulary that students could use to respond to the teacher and answer questions. And we're using the mode of communication that might be used by just one or two students in our classroom. So universal design for learning increases access for everyone um, and allows all students to work together using a different lens. So let's dig a little deeper into specially designed instruction and supplementary aids and services. If you're a teacher or administrator in the state of Kentucky, we have a fantastic IEP and lesson plan handbook that's been provided by the Kentucky Department of Education. It was produced in 2014 and is uploaded on KDE's website as a Word document which is fantastic for us because we can download this document and then make updates to it with the most recent evidence-based practices that have come out since this document was produced in 2014. So I would encourage you to download your own copy and I've hyperlinked in um, to the KDE website and then go ahead and start um, making some modifications to this document to make it usable in your building. It's a great thing to do as a grade level team to go through the different sections and look at what's been recommended here, talk together about evidence-based practices you're using in your building, um, and then really try and fine tune this to be a usable document for your building or your district. The page I have up here is showing basic reading and this starts about page 13 in the document and you'll notice that the tables are consistent throughout there will always be specially designed instruction on the left and supplementary aids and services on the right um, i would remind you and i'll say this again later in the training but just as a reminder here when you see a supplementary aid and service that you might add for a student a key question to always ask yourself is has this student ever been taught to use this supplementary aids and service? So for example, here we have graphic organizers. The third one down is recorded materials. The fourth one down is alternate electronic or digitized materials. If the student hasn't been yet taught to use any of those things, then I would highly encourage you to consider, is it appropriate to add specially designed instruction for those supplementary aids and services. And it might look something like this. Explicit instruction in the use of graphic organizers for whatever the topic is, right? But um, to specify how you're going to teach students to use those supplementary aids and services. All right, so let's dive deeper into SDI. We've already said that it's what the special education teacher does and it always starts with a special education teacher. Then other adults can support, but it always needs to start with a special education teacher. It is focused on the IEP goals, not the length of time of a class. So for example, if I have an IEP goal for a student and their specially designed instruction is explicit instruction in phonemic awareness, or explicit instruction in decoding multisyllabic words, then I am only going to count the amount of time per day or per week or per month, however your school counts time, but I'm only going to count the amount of time that I am going to be explicitly teaching that concept to my student. We're looking in specially designed instruction um, to provide instruction that will help the student master the skill or strategy for which they have a deficit. 
it's that direct teaching time to, I always think of it as like, I am sitting in front of this student. My mouth is moving. My hands are moving. I am actively engaged with this student. That is the time that I am counting. Even if I am co-teaching in a co-taught classroom where I would be providing the specially designed instruction, I'm not counting the entire time I'm co-teaching for the SDI, but rather I'm counting that amount of time that I'll be delivering instruction. I've got some examples there on the right, including the terms direct or explicit instruction. Those terms at this point are being used interchangeably. Um, I tend to use the term explicit instruction um, because I follow the Anita Archer (laughs) school of thought for the terminology. And so I use the term explicit instruction. It could also be um, specially designed instruction, could be modeling or guided practice. It could be scaffolded instruction, but it definitely needs to be teaching time. When we're thinking about supplementary aids and services, now we're thinking strictly of the student. And it's what that student needs to be able to access the content. When we're thinking about supplementary aids and services, we're also thinking about their goals and how the student will be able to show their mastery of those skills and strategies. But it goes also larger than just their IEP goals and you're thinking across the entire content. We have to keep in mind that students need to be taught how to use that supplementary aid and service appropriately. Um, And we're definitely thinking about how we're going to scaffold that over time. Some examples of supplementary aids and services that are on the upper right hand corner could include things like number lines and readers, scribes for brainstorming. I would encourage you when you're thinking about supplementary aids and services, um, not to think so broadly Um, like just using the term reader, but rather um, specify when a reader is actually needed. Um, So if a student is able to read at the second grade level and they're in the fifth grade, then I would say, you know, reader for any content above ability level or above a 2.5 reading level or however you're specifying that in your building. Keep in mind that students have to use SAS in their day-to-day learning in order to be allowed to use that for an accommodation for testing. I've got an example down at the bottom just to remind us of kind of thinking through. If a student has graphic organizers listed as a supplementary aid and service, were they taught to use graphic organizers? And the answer might be yes, they were taught at some point how to use graphic organizer, but now that they're in middle school, Graphic organizers are used a very different way. So we might need to, again, include that specially design instruction because um, it's a different type of graphic organizer or a different process than we'd used in the past. I'd like to, as we're thinking about SAS, um, have you kind of think with me for a minute. And um, right now for our our little conversation, we're going to the pool. So if you'll go with me, this is um, one of my friend's pools in her backyard. Lucky, lucky her. Isn't it beautiful? And she has this beautiful pool and she is a very kind person. So I have younger children and my younger children are not great swimmers, but a lot of their friends are beautifully wonderful swimmers. And so we belonged to a pool and in that pool, no one was allowed to have floats unless you were a baby in the baby pool. And my kids um, were not able to get in the pool. So they would sit and put their feet in the pool or they would hang on the, um, the ladders or they would hang on the edge of the pool, but they were never able to get in and swim. And they were really miserable at the beginning of the summer. And by midsummer, they were like, we don't wanna to go to the pool anymore. It was embarrassing for them, right? So I looked for a public pool that had um, open float access. And at this pool, everybody uses floats and it's a big kind of contest to have the coolest floats, right? So we got a pink flamingo float. We got a blue llama float. We've got floats that look like popsicles. We've got floats that look like hot dogs. We have cool floats and we take them to the pool and everybody uses floats. Grownups are out there with their drink caddy floats. There are grandparents with floats. Everybody has them. And my kids can dive in and out of the pool with their floats, hang with their friends, and they have a blast. If we think about the pool as a general education content, Lots of kids can dive into that pool, into the gen ed content, and need limited support or no support. Some of them, we'll be honest, they could teach us, right? They don't need help. They're swimming away. But we have students with disabilities who cannot get in the pool without a float. 
But yet sometimes we give them these giant red lifeguard floats and say, here, get in the pool with everybody else. And they're not getting in the pool. What does that look like? We have kids that are refusing to have a reader or they'll say, oh, I don't need to go out and have my test read to me. I'm fine. And they get an F. I can read this by myself. I, I don't need a reader. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And they get an F, right? Um, kids that start refusing services. It's because we've turned those accommodations into big lifeguard floats instead of making them age appropriate. How can we make them age appropriate? How can we make them cooler? By doing what I did as a parent, as a teacher, right? I'm going to look around and I'm going to find that universally designed for learning way to increase access so that we have cool pool floats across the room. I'm using my adapted scissors and everybody can use them that would like to. I'm providing all different varieties of reading text and saying to people, choose the reading text that you'd like to look at today, but really trying to increase access so that using an accommodation, using a supplementary aids and services um, isn't something that makes you feel stigmatized or like you're hanging at the pool ladder, but rather is letting you get in and really dive in to the deep learning we'd like our students to access. So if you'd like to practice these concepts with your team, I've got a handout here and it is a whole series of cards that you can cut out. So I've gone ahead and done some of my own scaffolding here. So every term has a little gift tag at the top and you'll see above SDI, there's a little gift tag. So all the terms have those little gift tags. And for every gift tag, you're going to want to find a pencil. The pencils are the definition. So you're going to match a pencil to the gift tag. And then you're also going to match a key so that every term has a tag, a pencil, and a key. And the keys are either examples or further explanations. Um, <clears throat> but that's a great activity that you all can do just to further your knowledge of SDI, SAS, accommodations, and modifications. But I also share it out as a great way to scaffold learning for students. I did this a lot with my vocabulary terms in class. When we're thinking about um, framework for considering all of the supplementary aids and services a student might need, I wanted to share a few more resources with you. So the document is linked there in yellow. And here it's just allowing us to think through a little bit different lens about the potential instructional supports a student might need, if there's some physical supports a student might need. And I would encourage you to think beyond kids with mobility access issues, but also think about those physical modifications for students with significant behaviors or a background in trauma, um, kids that are experiencing extreme stress, you might want to think about some physical modifications to your room. In addition, you might want to be thinking about some social behavioral supports that you can put in place and possibly some collaborative supports if there are other adults where you can teach together um, and support learning together, what might you all do as an effective teaching team? And Kim will dig deeper into that with you in co-teaching, but it's good to start thinking about that. Another great activity to start thinking about with your team is dividing up the sections of the um, lesson plan handbook by all the different groups and really highlighting um, those evidence-based practices that you know will support your students and really making sure that document is something that you can use every day. There's another resource that you could use as a team or uh, for a grade level um, and think about that universal design for learning lens in your school. Um, the handout has a few examples at the top and the encouragement here is this. I'd like for you all to think about some general education classroom practices. So for example, in fourth grade, you all might say, you know, this is a year where everybody gives an oral report. And so in our classroom or in our group of students in fourth grade, we have several students who use an AAC device. That's the center, the barrier that might be there. So a possible strategy that we might use is to allow students to pre-record or help program the report on their voice output system. If you think through some of the big activities or the big ways that you teach and learn in your grades or in your buildings and any barriers that possibly exist, is there a way that you could provide some kind of an SAS support that also might benefit all students? And then how could you put that in place together as a team? 
if you'd like to dig deeper in at a classroom level, um, this link on this page has um, a handout that you could use to look at your own practice um, classroom to classroom, thinking through all of the different resources that you might use in instruction, and then possible barriers that might exist with those resources, and then some potential strategies that you could put in place to support. Again, this isn't a bad thing to think about from a team level, for example, if you're teaching at the secondary level and you realize that a textbook or curriculum that you have that you really like is written at a grade level that is not appropriate for a lot of your students, then is there a way that you can work as a team to start modifying that text or providing different opportunities to engage in that text that all students could use to access? At the end of that form, um, there's a little table that you could use to think student by student. Um, what does each student need? And this, that left column is specific to the, that supplementary aids and services. The middle column, um, thinking about adult resources, like what do adults need in order to support that student? And those um, things that are listed in the middle might fall under the program supports and modifications for school personnel on your IEP. On the far right column, we've got other requirements for implementation. So other things that you all might be considering as a team, and um, that could be documented in a student's uh, conference summary. So really thinking from that lens of what does each student need? And then is there a way to provide access in a UDL lens that would support everybody in my class or my grade level or building? A key learning point here that we need to keep reminding ourselves of and our colleagues, if a student's IEP lists a supplementary aids and service or an accommodation or a modification, it is not optional for any teacher or adult to decide not to provide it. If that has been agreed upon by an IEP team, it is a legally binding document and we are required to provide it. So if you need or adults in your building need additional supports and understanding how to provide that accommodation, we definitely want to provide either an understanding of why it's being provided or a way to provide it, but it legally must be provided. A few reminders when we're thinking through that IEP lens. The Ender F Supreme Court ruling reminds us that parent involvement is crucial in IEP meetings. We also know that if progress isn't happening and isn't being documented in um, the progress monitoring system, then we should consider making a change and not making a change a year later, but rather making a change um, that would help a student, which might mean for some of us calling an IEP team meeting, you know, before the end of that IEP cycle. Um, some things that we might want to consider. Thinking about the student's present levels, in the present levels, is it data driven? Does it clearly reflect where the student's progress is? And is the present levels clearly aligned to the goals? So for example, if I have a goal for reading fluency that's words per minute, do I have a present levels data that tells me what the words per minute were at the development of the IEP and you know is that student showing adequate progress. We want to think about the considerations of special factors and really think about the sections for behavior and technology. Maybe there are some other barriers in behavior that we might want to consider. We might also want to look at the goals and see if the goal that we chose was the strategy or skill focused enough that it's really supporting the student's area of need or have we missed the target a little bit and we need to go back and think about a different strategy or skill that might support the student's progress better. We really want to think about that specially designed instruction and if it was targeted appropriately. You know, did we include explicit instruction in the specific skill deficits the student has? We also want to think about adult supports and making sure that the adults all understand and know how to analyze that progress to see that the student is making progress. And we definitely want to make sure that the special education minutes and the related service minutes, if a student has those, are aligned and everything makes logical sense. If you'd like to dig deeper into this concept, there is an IEP training um, one for administrators and one for teachers that you can dive into to go further into that concept. 
Another form that you might want to check out, and again, we just tried to provide a lot of resources to help you think through as a teacher or a team. So not all of these forms might be something that you want to dive into, but it's always nice to have them on hand. If you have a student and you're really trying to think through if their SAS is appropriate, and this form gives you some questions that you could use and some suggested areas of the IEP to check to look at each goal for your student. So just an individual walkthrough form. When we are thinking about student learning and how we can make a difference, um, the concept of empowerment and self-advocacy is very important. Um, on this slide, there's a quick reminder that a fantastic resource produced by the Council for Exceptional Children's Division case, which is for special education administrators, written by John O'Connor. It's called Great Instruction, Great Achievement. It is a, a short book, a quick read, but so powerful in really thinking about what we can do to change um, progress for students with disabilities and really increase their, their um, progress. One concept that I think about a lot when I'm thinking about my own teaching is how am I providing access for students? Um, is this a lesson where students feel like they have to be compliant? In other words, learning because they have to. Or is this a time when I've made this lesson something that they want to engage with and now they're learning because they are interested? They know the why of the lesson. Or is this something that they're learning because they feel empowered? There's value to the lesson. They know that mastering this concept is going to make a difference for themselves. I always want to get to that empowered part of a lesson and stay as far away from the compliance end of a lesson as possible. So with each thing that I'm teaching, I quickly think to myself, is where am I on the CEE continuum? Am I at the compliant end or the empowered end? If I'm somewhere in the middle, how can I get as close to empowered as possible? All right, you are ready for the next steps. Thanks for walking through this overview with me. I hope you enjoyed our little journey and our time at the pool. Um, enjoy the next part of learning. And if you've got any questions, please reach out. Happy Learning Day.